So good afternoon, everybody. Just to run through a couple housekeeping guidelines. Most of you already know these because you've been on these meetings before, but uh, just um, make sure that your microphone is muted and you keep it muted throughout the meeting, unless you're talking, of course. Um, only use the chat function in Teams uh, for official comments, so please try to avoid <coughs> back and forth discussion on the chat. Uh, use the raise hand icon to ask to be recognized by the chair uh, or to make a, a comment. And I want to remind you that your meeting is being recorded. Uh, cameras are optional. If you want to use them, you can turn them on using a little camera icon on your toolbar. So that is all that I have. And um, yeah, so I guess we can pass the mic. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. Appreciate you walking us through this. Hopefully everybody's getting a little bit used to this process now. We've uh, we've been doing this a few times. And uh, again, I want to thank everyone for your patience and your grace in uh, getting us through the not only this process, but also doing it remotely. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Laura Campbell. I'm one of your co-chairs for the Water Use Advisory Council. I'm going to be starting us off here today. And similar to how we've done in the past, we want to try to quickly get through our roll call of members, make sure we're capturing uh, who else has joined us in the meeting this afternoon. And then I am going to ask for if there are any, uh, after I'm done going through uh, our attendees and roll call, I'm going to ask if there are any changes that anyone wants to propose to today's agenda and also to the minutes of our last meeting, which hopefully you've received either by email or uh, by jumping on the website to to access those previous meeting minutes. All right, rolling right off here. Um, I'm going to go through our, our uh, council members and then and then uh, again try to make sure we're capturing anybody else who's here. If you are here as an alternate on behalf of a council member, go ahead and speak up when I call that council member's name. Uh, Margaret Bettenhausen. Here. Thank you. Tammy Newcomb. Good afternoon. Hi. Charlie Scott. Christine Alexander. Here. Thank you. Doug Needham. Yes, here from Lansing. Last time we had to have a- Oh, that's right, that's right. James Cliff told us we had to say where we're, where, where we're calling in from. That's like a new rule for uh, these remote meetings. I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask Margaret, where are you, where are you logging in from? East Lansing. All right, thank you, Tammy. Um, Weberville. Weberville, all right, thanks. Chris? Okamas. Thank you, Doug. And you said you're calling, calling in from Lansing. Uh, James Clift? Uh, here, Lansing, Michigan. All right, thank you. Steve Kohler? Here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. All right, thank you. Tom Zimnicki? Uh, here. Uh, from Lansing. Thank you. Dave Hamilton. Here from Hazlitt. Thank you. Frank Edowajashek. I'm here from Harbor Springs. Thank you. Jim Nicholas. I'm here from Shelby, Michigan. Thank you. Mike Gallagher. Pat Statskevitz. I'm here from Grand Haven, Michigan. Thank you. Jim Johnson. John Yelich. Here from Papa. Thank you. Brian Eggers. Here in Saginaw. Thank you. Brian Burroughs. Here from DeWitt, Michigan. All right, thank you. And I am calling in from East Lansing, Michigan. Scott Dubow. Present from Portage, Michigan. Portage, all right, thank you. Buddy Sebastian? I don't, Laura, this is Mike Frederick. I don't think Buddy is going to be joining. Okay, so you're here on his behalf. So where, are I, you, where are you logging yeah. in from? Lansing, Michigan, or should right. I say an undisclosed location? <laughs> but... <laughs> well, so long as you're not so tallying any votes today, I think you can say, you're safe to say you're calling from Lansing. <laughs> Safe, safe counting math was not my strong suit as a youth, so I am not counting anything. 
<laughs> Good to know. Jason Walther. Uh, here in Three Rivers, Michigan. Thank you. Kyle Rora. And Tom Frazier. Yep, here from Hazlitt. Awesome, thank you. Wow, we got good turnout today. Thanks everybody for logging in. All right, so let's see, as I go down the list here, looks like we've also got, uh, and I apologize if I accidentally call you when I've already called you, Hannah Arnett, um, Dave Grieco, uh, Abby Eaton, I see you're on. Are you on on behalf of Jim? Yes. Thank you, East, Abby. East Lansing. Thanks. Emily Finnell, Christopher Gothberg, Grant Poole, Ralph Hefner, Joel Henry. Uh, let's see, I already got Jim. Um, Clay Dupree, Kelly Turner, I've got you on here too. Uh, Andy LeBaron, Dave Lush, Mark Seaman, Mike Frederick, I've got you. Uh, Jim Milne. Uh, Jim Ostrowski, our, uh, our host and organizer for today. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Proctor, Nathaniel Schuff. Oh, Steve, I do see you uh, on here. Steve Kohler, yep. Taylor Ritterbush, Ben Terrell, Todd Feenstra. And I've got one phone number if you don't mind identifying yourself. It starts with a nine and ends with zero, zero. Kelly Bilotti calling in from DNR. Thank you. All right, is there anybody I've missed? All right, um, I'm gonna now ask if there's any additional items people want to uh, add or change to the agenda for today. And again, this is this is one that you've hopefully received by email uh, and is also available on the website. I'm not hearing any uh, proposed changes. Let's move on to the minutes from our last meeting in October. Uh, any changes or amendments to those draft minutes? All right, hearing none, uh, we're going to go ahead and accept those as well. And we will move at this time on to public comment. Uh, again, we uh, we like to we like to focus these comments on any agenda items, and we'll have another opportunity for public comment for uh, unrelated or or non agenda related topics. So, any any comments on items related to today's agenda? All right, I am hearing none and I am seeing none in the chat. So uh, I, we will uh, we will consider note uh, that there's no public comments on agenda items for today. And so we'll roll right into the meat to the meat of our meeting. Uh, final edits for the legislative report. Um, and I want to say, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for again, your patience and for uh, your willingness to go through what uh, for some of you has been several versions. <laughs> this report and the language, I got a lot of really good comments and a lot of good uh, corrections. Um, and so most of what has been made here has been uh, has been very minor structural changes, fixing statutory statutory citations and, uh, you know, making sure grammar is correct, making sure that we're identifying, uh, you know, terms that we use as acronyms throughout the report the first time they're mentioned, you know, making sure those are spelled out. Um, there were a few changes that were a little bit more substantive that I wanted to go through with you guys today. Um, to make sure that you're aware of them and also to make sure that we're clear on uh, everybody kind of being on the same page for how we want to deal with these. Um, so, uh, Jim, if you don't mind jumping into that next slide there, we've got a slide for for each of the questions that I uh, that I had come up with. The first one was um, 
that there were a few commenters who suggested that throughout the report, rather than referring to specific committees within the council, either making recommendations or, you know, being assigned responsibility uh, for, for doing pieces of work that it should, that the report itself should just say, this is going to be done by the Water Use Advisory Council. And so before I finalize those changes, I wanted to get feedback from you guys on if that's how you prefer uh, to, to have that report structured, or do you prefer there to be either some instances or in all instances uh, in which the specific committee that's either making a recommendation or who is gonna be assigned to do work uh, follows up on that. And Frank, I see your hand up. Yeah, this this suggestion uh, makes sense to me because we might actually committees may actually change and move uh, in the future, or or we may be consolidating or separating in different things. And I think it makes sense to 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 do it this way. Thank you. All right, thanks, Frank. Any other thoughts? Or I guess more specifically, does anybody object to this being done? Because that was the change that I made in the draft that you guys uh, hopefully saw come back out uh, in this last week. Um, and I want to make sure that nobody's uncomfortable with that. John Yelich, I see your hand up. OK, just just a comment is that the main report is just going to be a summary and consensus of the Water Use Advisory Council, that there will be attachments, will be the different documents from the different committees. So I agree with what Frank said, if we just leave it that way, if that's how it's going to be, then I would say that we leave it the way it is, where we do not have anything specific in the main document, but the attachments are the things that actually tell the story, if there has to be. Okay, thank you, John, appreciate it. Any other thoughts on this topic before we move on? All right, I'm hearing and seeing none, so, uh, so we'll go ahead and finalize that change that throughout the report, um, rather than uh, rather than any specific committee being brought up as making recommendations or doing a task, that it's going to be the Water Use Advisory Council with the understanding that the groups who have, you know, who have led and proposed the, these topics are, are responsible for them. And if there's work that you guys have said you're gonna do, you still have to actually do it. So thank you for that. Um, okay, this one is more of a technical issue and I'm hoping our, uh, our folks from Eagle uh, who are on the line today can help me out with this. Um, there was a reference on a couple of the pages to, w to where uh, when we are talking about the recommendation for funding for the uh, for the monitoring that uh, the Clean Michigan Initiative and Renew Michigan programs, uh, the, the report had originally state that their funding ends at the end of the next fiscal year. And uh, a comment suggested that we specifically say, is this the end of fiscal year 2021 or 2022. So I need confirmation on which year that the, those programs actually end their funding to make sure that we're not incorrectly stating when they, when they wrap up. Um, this is James, not hearing anybody else. We can double check that. I don't know off the top of my head and I don't know given the budget that passed what got extended so I can check into that. OK, thank you, James. I appreciate that. All thank right, the next the next one we've got. So we're going to hold off on that until we get a uh, confirmation on when that actually ends to make sure that we're correct on that. Um, I have uh, I have asked Kelly Turner and Emily Fennell, who have done uh, just tremendous work, yeoman's work, uh, putting together the, these uh, recommendations for the conservation committee and uh, uh, and and those recommendations you all saw and approved at our meeting in October. But then there were some there were some suggestions for for some uh, additional language, some amendments to those. Uh, to those recommendations. They have made some some of these minor recommendations. They were in the new draft report that uh, that went out to you guys. And I've asked Emily and Kelly if you can kind of walk us through those changes to make sure everybody's clear on what actually got changed and that you're still comfortable with, with uh, a, your consensus vote on approving these to be in the report. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, 
I don't know if it's easier to share my screen, but I did pull up the Word documents um, and I've highlighted uh, where we've made changes and it. I'm a visual, so it might be easiest for people to take a look at these that way. Sorry for the interruption and. Not a problem at all. Um, Jim, are we able to give Kelly permission to request control and, and share her screen? Jim Ostrowski, are you still on? Can uh, Kelly sorry. go ahead and share her screen? <laughs> Yeah, hold on a second. That'd be a finder. Uh, Kelly. Um, you should be able to share, Kelly. Um, I was going to say, oh, there I, we go. Can we can say go. I yeah. see my screen. I'm trying. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. You guys are wonderful. All right. Well, we will start with the water conservation and efficiency efforts through state climate, energy, and water infrastructure initiatives. So, I, first, I'd like to uh, really uh, a shout out to everybody who uh, attended. Uh, the meetings that we had for these as well as provided input because I think um, having all of the stakeholders in the room provide input and really massage these recommendations makes it something that we can really all buy into. So I appreciate the dialogue. I appreciate the information and the uh, help getting it up so that we can all agree on them. Kelly, a quick question. Can you blow that up on the screen a little because my screen's pretty small. I can I just want to be to follow along. Uh, sure. How's that? Uh, well, try try going a little. Try getting it bigger if, to the as big as you can. Got old eyes here. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Better. <laughs> yep. Yes. All right. So uh, we didn't make a lot of changes to either one of these, but uh, the changes we made were very pointed and directed uh, based off of the comments and the input that we received from all of you. So uh, where the big changes were made in this. Uh, really was because there was confusion the way that we had the cost analysis and the funding written up. And so big shout out to Emily too for um, taking everyone's input and revising this. So for the cost analysis and funding recommendation, we have uh, revised this to say that we are going to request a proposal in consultation with uh, the Water Conservation and Efficiency Committee to award a $50,000 contract for a consultant to do um, four items. And we tried to really spell out these four items. So the first would be to conduct an assessment of uh, our current climate, energy, and sustainability and water infrastructure policies and programs, then identify gaps and opportunities uh, where we could strategically integrate conservation and efficiency into future policies and programs, and then three, assess successful federal programs and other water rich states and, and what they're doing and things that we uh, could possibly be able to integrate into our policy and programs, and then make those recommendations not only to the Water Conservation and Efficiency Committee, but also to the full uh, council in, in hopes of improving our conservation and efficiency programs statewide. When it comes to the implementing organization, uh, remember we also had um, some confusion in here, and so we really pared this down. Uh, so this recommendation would uh, ask Eagle and MDARD staff to uh, support the standing um, Water Conservation and Efficiency Committee once we get that organized and up and running to uh, develop and administer the request for proposal process for this uh, uh, consultation and administer the contract and make recommendations to the committee based on the assessment when it comes back. So those were the changes that we made because uh, for those of you who might not remember, we had some conflicting language in there um, for possible funding through uh, some other granting processes. And uh, the conversation was that we can still pursue those other grant processes However, if we are not successful in capturing um, revenue to cover 
uh, the proposal through that granting process, then this would really be our fallback to make sure that we had the funding necessary to move forward either way. So what a great thing it would be if we were awarded the $50,000 through the state for this and then we're able to give it back because we didn't need it. Uh, but this is definitely the fail safe plan. So I don't know if anyone has questions on this. So far. Any questions for Kelly about those changes? Or any, con I should I should say more specifically, any concerns about these um, to uh, to allow your silence to be consent and consensus that these changes are going to go forward for the final report? This is the one time I love silence, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Just a comment. Good changes, Kelly. It's very easy to understand now. Thank you. Oh, good. Well, I give I give Emily and the team a lot of credit for that, as well as the input from the committee. So, all right, I will move on then to the second recommendation uh, where we had some some additional input to try to address some of the concerns and some of the ideas. So there were a lot of really good ideas that came out of the discussion from the full council when we first presented these. And in order to, uh, we made some clarifying statements in here. Uh, we had a tremendous meeting uh, that included MSU Extension and uh, a lot of other stakeholders. and. Uh, I don't know that we made a lot of headway down a lot of the paths that were mentioned, but I think we definitely cleaned up the language and provided space for stakeholders um, to be able to come together and make a plan, uh, but also provided some direction. So you'll see what I mean here in a second. Um, we added this statement at the very beginning of this recommendation because it was un that really this recommendation is a subset of the first one. So the first one really talks about uh, statewide policy and uh, programs, but this addresses a uh, one of the sectors of water users that is uh, gets a lot of attention and really um, we wanted to pay homage to the original um, recommendations that were made, and so that's where how this was born. But uh, we added this first statement that really um, part of conservation, whenever we're talking about that in Michigan, um, really needs to include agriculture uh, because of its importance that it plays within reaching the state's uh, water use objectives, uh, as well as being a major um, contributor to uh, the economy. Uh, Kelly, I'm, I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but if you have changed the document that you are trying that you are sharing, we cannot see it yet. Oh, that's spectacular. OK, uh, hmm. let me see. Let me try this again. Oh, all right, hang on. Well, this is fun. Maybe more for me than for you, honestly. <laughs> it's a little bit different than Zoom. Thank you for bearing with me. Everybody can just mentally play the uh, Jeopardy theme song, you know, when everybody takes the time to write down their final answer for the quiz while we're <laughs> right. while we're waiting. OK. Huh. Come on now. Sure. Be nice. Why are you not playing nice? Man. OK. Now you should be able to see it, hopefully. If I've done it correctly. So you should see at the top the um, uh, water Conservation Committee recommendation for increasing water efficiency and conservation practices in the agriculture industry. Is that what you're seeing? 
Yes, yeah. now we can see oh, it. Two. Okay, awesome. So uh, now that I've talked about it, maybe you can actually finally read it here. Uh, but here's that uh, sentence that we added really at the beginning to to really show that this is just uh, a subset of the first recommendation and uh, focuses on the agricultural industry. Uh, we added that for clarity. After, oh gosh, um, our meeting went long, so it was almost a two hour meeting with MSU Extension and uh, other stakeholders who had questions and comments about how this could be revised. We ended up adding into the recommended action uh, the USDA and the NRCS as stakeholder groups, and uh, along with MDART Eagle and Michigan State University Extension. Uh, and put this under the direction of the full uh, council. Uh, that was noted as uh, something that people really felt needed to be in the language uh, during our last meeting. We also added that there be a focus in Zone C watershed management areas. This was to address some concerns uh, out there that, you know, um, we really needed to figure out if we're where we're going to focus this education. Just understand though that some of the feedback we got from MSU Extension is by nature. Uh, the program and the education that they offered is statewide. They can definitely try to focus some of their efforts in Zone C, but they're not going to um, keep other areas of the state from getting the same education, especially if they're asking for it. Uh, we've added to this some language that really um, helps to hone in on uh, the education should also include uh, how to navigate the USDA and NRCS programs that address water efficiency and to help those irrigators navigate the application process since that can be cumbersome and require some technical uh, as well. We also added in that uh, at the end of this three year period, the program would be reviewed by the full council to determine uh, whether it merits the long term uh, funding that we had talked uh, earlier in the first recommendation. So we removed the language or we modified the language that said that it would be uh, turn into uh, a long term program for continued funding and we really put some uh, parameters around it so that we have the ability to come back and take a look at uh, the metrics and determine whether or not it it merits long term funding. Again, we made changes here just adding USDA and NRCS and then our time frame we tightened up a bit too so uh, we continue this as a three year time frame because it's needed to develop, initiate, implement and evaluate the program. But after those first three years, uh, those positions may become institutionalized um, if uh, the WUEC is favorable uh, with the review that it conducts. So those were the changes that we made there. Now I'll just say that we had a ton of conversation around um, the tools that we could be asking for. I know there was a lot of conversation about metering and we did have a lot of conversation around that topic during this meeting where we uh, met to kind of revise this. Part of why we didn't add it in here is we felt it was really important to provide uh, space for these implementing organizations to come together, brainstorm and build program uh, in a way that best fits them. And there was a lot of concern for what sort of meters would be used um, to share between farmers. Um, the cost was fairly substantial for those, even for uh, less expensive ones. And then really it came down to, well, um, what is the technical expertise of those people who would be using this? Uh, and we really felt that the the better way to go about it would be to somehow include a third party to be able to go back through and supply um, metering uh, functions for these these uh, farmers to double check and make sure that they had everything calibrated correctly uh, because we could be adding injury to insult if they use the meters incorrectly and um, it turned into kind of a 
a hornet's nest. And so we felt that it would be best to kind of leave it to this these groups who are going to put together the plan to to have the freedom to figure out how they would like to include something like that. So. Um, I think that's all of the changes I had for this, unless people have questions or um, things that they wanted to, to bring up. Or if Dave I Lush. forgot anything, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Kelly. Dave Lush, I see you have a question. Hi, thanks. Kelly, are there any um, water conservation programs of the US Department of Agriculture that do not get delivered through NRCS? Ooh, that's a great question and one that I probably am not equipped to answer at this time. I guess I would ask for others in the room who might have uh, more knowledge on that to chime my in. Experience, if you know. My experience has been that NRCS is the agency that delivers these programs and it seems like in one page up from where you currently are, your language was differentiating between USDA and NRCS, but I think all those programs are delivered through NRCS, which is obviously an agency of the USDA. So as an example, in that final uh, sentence on that paragraph, uh, you shouldn't have a slash there between USDA and NRCS, it should be a comma, assuming that there are no conservation programs delivered by other USDA agencies. Thanks. Dave, that's a good point. And I, I think there I think there are some states that do get uh, USDA programs through other agencies for irrigation, but as far as I'm aware, they're primarily like the Western states. I, I'm not aware of any USDA pro irrigation programs, irrigation efficiency programs that come from any other USDA agency besides NRCS in Michigan. Abby, you have your hand up. The Western states would be Bureau of Land Management in addition to yeah. NRCS. Um, oh, but yeah. they, they could they could possibly get additional money through FSA. That's what but, I that's what I thought is I, I mean there are other agencies obviously US Army Corps does a lot of stuff around the Mississippi corridor and, and and Western states BLM does Western state irrigation stuff but for USDA programs I I I think they have some stuff that they offer through FSA and we only have NRCS here in Michigan. Um, well, yeah, um, I'm not so sure about that, but that that's regardless I, for nitpicking. Yeah, yeah, I, oh, yeah. I I'm not aware of any. <laughs> So I've inserted the word and in between USDA um, and NRCS in this, and so hopefully that maybe makes makes it a little more um, digestible. Dave, is that the is that the correction that you were suggesting, or were you suggesting that the that it should just be um, a comma to indicate that it's coming from? NRCS within USDA. Well, because hopefully this will be the final draft uh, and we have a question about this. I think the uh, weasel way out, uh, Kelly, is to drop NRCS entirely from these two paragraph or this paragraph and just refer to USDA MDARD Eagle and then in the follow in that last USDA programs. Because even if it's delivered by NRCS, it's still a USDA program. That solves the problem. I like that. Any objections to that? Abby, I, I see you've, you've, yeah, you've I got think, your hand I think up that, still. No, I think that works well. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't know my hand was still up. <laughs> so, here, sorry. <laughs> All right, so the suggested edit is to remove uh, reference to NRCS from these spots that we have in here. Is that correct? Yes, that's my suggestion. All right. All right, any thoughts, objections to that change, additional changes people want to make? Hey, Laura. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Do you? Do you still in plan to have them as a stakeholder, USDA? Does that change that at all? 
No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, because okay. we're referring to, to them just as USDA, that encompasses NRCS and any other USDA agency that might be involved, which, like I said, I'm not aware of any other agency in Michigan who's delivering irrigation programming. Okay. But we've covered our bases just by saying USDA. <laughs> All right, I can make those changes and get them over to Christine. That's no problem. All right, sounds good. Um, any other questions, comments, objections before this goes uh, to have silence meaning consensus? Dave, anything else you had to say? Your hand is still up and, and Christine, your hand is also still up. Other thoughts? Sorry, I didn't mean to keep my hand up. <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> just one just didn't want to cut you off there. All right, I am hearing silence as consent. Thanks, Kelly. Appreciate you walking us through that. Yeah. All right, there was one additional kind of substantive change that I wanted to go over with you guys. Um, Jim, if you don't mind putting the putting the meeting slides back up. Thanks. And we're going to be going to, let's see. Uh, yep, that's the slide. All right, so on page 18, this was in the well driller training recommendation. There was a comment that um, the, the way that the, that the sentence originally read was uh, that some of the data entry to well logic is a responsibility of the applicant to submit the correct data in a timely fashion. This is not the driller's responsibility and much of this data entry for high capacity wells has evolved and the applicant needs to know it is their responsibility. The comment was basically around, you know, if this is a if this is a recommendation for well driller training, then it, it then it would seem to undercut that need by saying, hey, this is this stuff is the responsibility of the well owner and not the well driller um and but they didn't give a, a a uh suggested language piece for correcting that i took a stab at it and it's what you can see on the screen right now so it uh and i and what i wanted to do is make sure that this doesn't change the meaning or the intent of this statement or if it does how can we better state this to make sure that we're clear without suggesting that well drillers don't actually need this training because it's because everything is the well owner's responsibility anyway. So what, what it would read now is to say um, some of the data entry to well logic is that whoa, it just disappeared. <laughs> is the responsibility of the applicant to submit the correct data in a timely fashion. The applicant's portion of data submission is not the driller's responsibility. So uh, Dave Hamilton, I see your hand up and then Dave Lush and then Mike Frederick. Yeah, I was I was confused by this uh, first on page 18. That was part of the Michigan Hydrologic Framework write up. So I, I couldn't find um, where this was. So I didn't have a good sense of the context of it. And it still strikes me as, from your explanation. It still strikes me as confusing. I don't have a suggestion, but um, yeah. if the, the way it sounds is that you're telling well drillers then that it's up to the applicant. You don't have to worry about it. And I, I'm not sure that's the right message. So I, I still think it's confusing. Okay. Do you, uh, okay. And you said you don't have a, you don't have a suggestion for how to make that more clear. Okay. So I guess to, to clarify, when I say page 18, I mean, page 18 of the most recent draft that came out, uh, that, that probably pushed some things back because of all of the uh, because of the replacement of the two recommendations from the Conservation Committee. So this is appearing under the um, this is appearing under the well driller trainings for improved data recommendation. This is not the hydrologic framework. Um, John Yelich, you're on. Are you and, and this I know you uh, you did a lot of work to, to put this together because this has been your program. Do you have a recommendation for how to make this more clear? I, I was waiting to hear what anybody else's comments are, but just going okay. back to the meetings that we had, but uh, Jim Milne was involved in this as well as Anita uh, from the water division. And and if you recall, what we wanted to do is to try and get a, a program out, format out in all the publications, and that's through the Farm Bureau and through everything else. 
making sure that people understood that as an applicant, it's your responsibility to do these things. And that in many cases, it can be a well drill that they've given the responsibility to or to their irrigation contractor. But we wanted to make sure the ultimate responsibility was the own the applicant themselves. And that's why this is part of the well drillers training program is to make sure that they communicate that directly with the people if they happen to be the one that's filling in the data. OK, um, Dave Lush, you had your hand up as well. Thanks, Laura. I, I think we've got a little mistake here. Um, well, logic is the electronic database that accepts the water well and pump record form, which is required of water well drilling contractors under part 127. So there is no applicant responsibility for the water well and pump record form. I think what might have been referred to originally was the application through the, the water withdrawal uh, tool that, you know, in terms of where depth, pumping capacity, all those things we fill in uh, to get a um, evaluation through the tool, those data are the responsibility of the applicant. But under part 127, the water well and pump record form, which if the contractor chooses, he can submit electronically through well logic. That is still their legal requirement. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Mike Frederick, you had your hand up also. Yep, a couple of comments. Um, kind of partnering off of what Dave Lush just said and also. So when a, when a well is a permit is granted, the um, the permit goes to the property owner, not the well driller. Well drillers fill out the well record, as Dr. Lush just mentioned, as a courtesy, typically as a service to the property owner. At the end, the property owner is legally responsible for submitting that information to the health department as well as EGLE. So if there is ever an issue, technically it is the property owner's responsibility to make a correction in most cases. For example, if you don't have a, a clean sample, if you have failure to chlorinate or something like that, at the end of the day, that well is not usable until that property owner submits the proper information. So are we liable under the case like this, whereas our applicants portion they are all responsible for doing that. Well, logic is just, as Dr. Lush said, an electronic means of recording or reporting the information that's provided. There's a paper copy you can provide or you can do it electronically. Well, logic just makes it easier to do that. Most well drillers do that lot electronic logic. Okay, so thanks, there's Mike. Really no, there's really no an applicant's portion the entire thing is their responsibility. We just simply provide that in most cases as a courtesy service. OK, Doug, you have your hand up. So a thought on this is actually on page 15. Just to be clarified, I looked at that. Maybe that was document number 18, but the, the actual physical page. Why don't we just remove this whole section? Like beginning with it must be emphasized. This really isn't. I guess needed for this. Um, and so that would be my suggestion is just to remove this uh, kind of from that point on uh, to the to the rest of that paragraph. Doug, thanks for bringing that up because that was going to be my suggestion as well is looking at looking at kind of that whole paragraph of uh, you know describing the findings and recommendations of providing driller trainings and and when they would happen and uh just you know describing that it would be four to six training sessions that would allow the geological survey to load two to three thousand pounds of core samples bring them to a location um they would provide presentations physical sample descriptions and review and have eagle present the benefits of timely input of water qu of quality data not water quality of quality data to well logic and if that section just ends there then the, then it, the next word on that page would be the investment proposed what do you guys think about that 
Doug, is your hand still up or? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I got to I got to turn to put that down. I don't know how to do that here. I'll figure okay. it out. Okay. <laughs> yep, you just click the hand again and it and it gets rid of oh, it. Okay. Right, uh, Dave Lush, what about you? Uh, I actually think this is an important issue because as you know, one of the ongoing problems that the water use program has is when the original description in the tool ends up not being where the well is located or the depth or you know, other uh, things. And all of those data are the responsibility of the applicant uh, for a high capacity well. Um, so we were, I think the, the intent here was to try and get the uh, well drilling community on board with the idea of just another customer service that they provide is the reminder that, well, you said I was going to put it here at 200 feet, but now we're going to put it over there at 300 feet. And it's your responsibility, Mr. Irrigator or Miss Irrigator, back into the tool and, and make an adjustment because the, all the tool data are the sole responsibility of the applicant and not the well driller. So we're really talking here about trying to get well drillers on board with um, providing another customer service in reminding applicants of high capacity wells of their responsibility to keep Eagle informed of any changes that might occur. And this, as you know, has been a longstanding and plaguing problem that we've faced. Dave, I absolutely agree with you. And I and I I guess the question I would ask is kind of twofold. I mean, we are we do have another recommendation in this report that deals with the outreach effort that a number of uh, a number of folks have been have been working on, uh, which uh, which John Yelich is also involved in that talks about getting kind of an FAQ document out to uh, potential applicants uh, through the through the Watt system that talks about their responsibilities. Um, so knowing that, I guess the question I would ask is, even though it is a significant issue that has been ongoing, is it something that should be included in this recommendation for well driller training, or could it be dealt with by saying, for instance, in the previous sentence? Uh, previous to where to where this phrase comes in, where it says these trainings would provide presentations, physical sample descriptions, training and review, and ha and have Eagle present the benefits of timely input of quality data to Well Logic. What if you added in in that list of things that the trainings would provide? Maybe say something about presentations, physical sample descriptions, uh, applicant responsibilities, training and review. Laura, John here. Yes, John. I, I think that that captures the essence. Um, I think one of these things, and we didn't find out until we had our little uh, meeting where we were talking to everybody about what the issues are. And I know that from the water division, part of the issue is, is that, for example, the pump may not be put in right away by the driller and they may have somebody else do it or the applicant does it. And then it's left out there where there's no communication back to the state that actually something was done or that it was different than was originally input to the system. That's why we wanted to do the outreach. And I think that just that statement that you just put in can help a great deal of doing this. But it really is that people need to know that, and it's not the driller or the quote unquote, the irrigation contractor the responsibility, it's the applicant's responsibility to make sure that the input is correct and put in a timely fashion. And we were just trying to get away from, because. If you leave it on just a single entity, they're going to point to the driller. It's not the driller, it's the applicant, particularly when they tell the driller, go home, we're done. We don't want to pay you to do this because they figure they can do it themselves. And I, and that can happen on a lot of situations. All right, thanks. Um, Jim, can I can I share my screen and then that way make, make sure that we're clear as to what the proposed fix for this is that's on the table? because I want to show the whole paragraph. Go ahead, Laura, I stop sharing. OK. 
All right. Um, all right. Boy, I can't see this at all to tell if, if I'm actually sharing it. You're there. You are. You are. I am. OK, OK, so this is so this is what uh, <laughs> I can't see it at all <laughs> except for where I already have the document up. Um, OK, so this is this is what we could potentially do to to uh, to resolve this is rather than try to massage and uh, a, a couple of sentences that are never going to be clear. The paragraph could then say. These trainings would provide presentations, physical sample descriptions, applicant responsibilities, training and review, and have Eagle present the benefits of timely input of quality data to well logic. End of paragraph. What do you guys think? That would be great. I kind of that's kind of partnering off or pairing off of what Doug originally proposed, and I think that would be acceptable to us, Laura. It looks good to me, Laura. All okay, right, thanks. thanks. Dave Lush, you've got your hand up. Is that, uh, did you have a question or additional thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's an elegant solution to the problem. So I, I, I think that's a good one. OK. Any other thoughts or concerns before we uh, before we accept consensus on that? All right, hearing none. We'll uh, we'll go ahead and move on and back up to our screens. And at this point, we'll switch over to Brian Eggers and uh, let him carry on with the agenda. All right, Laura. Thanks, everybody. Um, Laura, I just wanted to offer a thank you. You put in so much work in editing this report to get it where it is. Um, thank you very much for your leadership. We are on agenda item number seven, process and timeline for completing the legislative report. Um, as we discussed, as we last discussed, the report will be sent electronically on this December to the legislator. And we're going to request the opportunity to present to the new legislators in January of next year. Um, and you, but do you want to add to that? Any concerns with that? Dave Lush? Are I saw, I thought I saw your hand up, Dave Lush. Michael. We were hearing before. Um, Just one thought, Brian. Um, typically, committee assignments and the makeup and everything else don't come out until mid to late January. So um, I would almost say you might want to push that into February. And that's more just of a simple housekeeping issue. Makes sense. We want the right people in the right seats on the bus when we get there. <laughs> they have to figure out where the bus is and who's driving it first. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. See another hand up here. Dave Hamilton. Yeah, um, I have a question on the process. We in finishing this up, we've finished up all of our recommendations as a council. Um, and what I'm wondering is that the process the State Departments are going through right now is that they're preparing the, uh, the governor's budget. And I guess I wonder should, if we can ask the departments, is there a way that they can convey to the governor's budget office that this will be coming through? And if there's a way that they could indicate support to uh, maybe help uh, fit it into the governor's budget, that might be another avenue for us to uh, to work besides the official report. So I guess I would frame that as a question back to the departments, if that's something that they could do to help out the council. So this is James, um, and you're right. You know we're we're now just starting kind of the process of you know looking at the budget for um, the next fiscal year that the governor will be presenting in, in February or whatever. Um, we will. So there's very kind of 
technical, formal ways we go about doing things like that as far as, you know, uh, requesting changes in our budget. Clearly, we can tell them this is coming. Um, clearly, we will review this document and look to see kind of what officially we include within our proposal going forward. Um, but I guess I don't want to leave people the impression that we don't necessarily we, we have to prioritize all of the funding within the department and we'll we'll kind of review this figure out where it fits um, and we'll kind of move forward with that but but obviously knowing that this will go to the legislature separately it's good to have them know that the entire document will be moving forward I, I think that's helpful James um, I think it's good to know that the department will at least look at it and consider it in their priorities that they recommend to the governor as well. Um, and I think any other support that the departments could give to this, um, uh, I think would be helpful. Thanks. James and Dave, thank you. Laura, your hands up. Yeah, thanks. Um, and James, I appreciate you talking about uh, some of the process of, of having to figure out your priorities, because I know that's been one of the challenges that we've had in the past, right, is the, you know, the council has made recommendations, um, you know, but then you go to a budget hearing and, you know, and there's the, uh, there's the legislative committee sitting there and there, you know, and there's the poor, uh, uh, the poor department director and, you know, the budget committee will say, all right, give me your top three, you know, your top three priorities right now. Uh, and, you know, the water use program a lot of times doesn't make it to like top three, you know, because they're doing things like PFAS and, you know, and, and huge, you know, huge environmental issues. Um, so I, that was one of the primary benefits I saw of us being able to kind of make our own recommendations to the legislature as a council to say, hey, look, you know, the, the department has a lot of things on their plate and these are, you know, priorities for this particular program that are, that is very important in the state. Um, but I do appreciate that, uh, you know, that, you know, if Eagle can let the, you know, the budget office know that this is coming and, it, you know, and, and of course, because we will have already sent our report out to the legislators as they're, you know, coming in in January and finding their desks and figuring out, uh, you know, who's going to lead these committees that they, that they also know that this stuff is coming um, so that, you know, so that they're able to, to, you know, receive us and, and have as many of the council members there as possible to help support that effort. So thanks. Thank you, Laura. Anybody else, any comments or questions on this? Okay, hearing none, we will move on to the depleted water management area update. And Dave Hamilton, are you leading this or Jim? Uh, Jim's going to start, show the slides. Yep. I'll run through the slides if Dave and Hannah can unmute themselves so they can feel free to jump in as need be. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to, we're going to present you with an updated version of the depleted water management area map and table that we presented you back at the meeting last August. Discussions between Dave and Water Use Assessment Unit staff, and want to also include Andy LeBaron, who contributed to this effort, led to revisions in the depleted water management area status table that Eagle presented to you at the August meeting. We're going to present to you today the revised map and table of the Zone D water management areas. And then we're going to present a map and table of Zone B cold transitional in zone C water management areas that have had at least eight site specific reviews. The purpose of showing you these zone B cold transitional and zone C water management areas is bring, to bring them to the council's attention as water management areas that should also be considered for additional data collection, modeling, and the possible formation of committees. And Dave, do you have anything you want to add at this point? Well, let's get to the maps and uh, I think it'll help uh, people understand what's going on. Okay. So the water management area is outlined in black, like 41352, 4135 here, 
are areas where the Water Use Advisory Council's Data Collection Committee recommended using a different storage aquifer storage coefficient in the tool. The water management areas in red are currently in zone D, meaning that the cumulative stream flow depletion has reached the point where an adverse resource impact is likely that is a negative stream flow depletion balance. And this is gonna be hard to see on the screen. That's why we're all, we sent out a PDF version to you by email. Email version will also follow up and it'll be on the web page for you to be able to zoom in and see some of the details. But I wanna walk you through some of the changes. So the index flow column here in gallons per minute, that is either going to be the original index flow estimate that was derived by the tools model when we have the first time we get a site specific review request in a water management area our hydrologic studies staff do an index flow review that will come back with a revised index flow value that might be higher than the same as or lower than the tools estimate. so for a depleted watershed odds are that this index flow value will be the result of the index flow review. The next column, allowable depletions, that's multiplying the index flow value by the percent allowable depletion in statute. For example, a cold transitional stream only allows 4% depletion, whereas a warm stream is 24% depletion. So multiply that out in GPM. And then the next column, current water management area status, that's our current cumulative stream flow depletion tracking total in gallons per minute. And then the file, far column on the right are comments and next steps that Eagle plans on taking. So comparing the value in the allowable depletion column to the current water management area status, you can see that, for example, Osborne drain in Cass County, which is a cold transitional stream, it's currently at a minus 102, and it's only allowed 63 gallons per minute. So it's going to be a very hard lift to get change a no to a yes in that watershed versus, for example, um, Makatawa River, minus 70 currently, but allowable depletion 916. There's a lot more room to play with. Dave, do you have uh, anything to add there? Yeah, let me just, um, so I think this is an important uh, table for us, just to understand what areas are, um, uh, have a likely ARI. And so, I mean, the department is putting time into this and I think uh, we may want to look at some of these issues as well. So I was looking specifically at are there policy um, things here that we should look at. And there's one that I think uh, we should, and that's under the, Wiscoggin drain, uh, the last uh, shaded um, row. And that is one that uh, there's an issue because uh, the index flow is zero. There's also an issue because it's in backwater to the Great Lakes. And so these are considerations that are uh, not common in the state. So for a zero index flow, uh, I don't think we did any work on it in developing the process where we looked at that. Uh, so I don't think anything's been done in the program before. So that may be something we'd want to look at. And there's very few places in the state that would have that, but there are a few in the thumb area where you could have a zero uh, uh, index flow. Uh, the other thing there is that uh, the way that uh, the Great Lakes were handled for the areas that are immediately adjacent to the Great Lakes, uh, but there's not a stream, it's just kind of the local area that uh, that is by the Great Lakes. Those were given automatic passes in the um, in the tool because it's assumed that groundwater is actually uh, eventually coming from the Great Lakes themselves. And so I think something similar may be the consideration when you've got uh, backwater coming up a stream that we may want to think about, but that I think there's a policy or potentially a policy issue there that we might want to consider. The other things uh, that I wanted to mention off the table 
is it on the Osborne drain? That's one that's in the area that the Cass County model uh, should cover. So I think that will help uh, potentially resolve this uh, when that model is, is completed. And otherwise, uh, several of these are in, in this um, situation because they had the bedrock pass. And as those that have been following this uh, through the program history, uh, that was changed uh, a few years ago, but a number of watersheds ended up in this category because of the bedrock pass. Um, I think that the only way to resolve it uh, uh, would be to model some of these. And I think in general, I'd wanna encourage the department to, when a watershed is getting into this situation, is that they should be modeling them and trying to figure out what is the water balance in that watershed. But I wanna hold off talking a little bit more about that in, in the context of the next group that we're gonna go through. So those are my comments on this, Jim. Okay. Yeah, just to a little backstory on the Wiscogan drain here. At the time the tool was developed, 2008-ish, that was in the middle of a 13-year stretch of low Great Lake levels, and now we're in a prolonged stretch of high lake levels, which really wasn't considered at the time. We've met with, our use staff have met with our hydrologic study staff, and Hydrologic Studies is developing a workaround proposal and what for how to revise an index flow for a water management area like this one that is under the influence of the high Great Lake water levels. So once we have that a workaround proposal, we want to take that back to the appropriate committee and the council and get their input about how they think we ought to proceed. Jim, Dave Vosh has his hand up. Dave. Um, thanks. Is it not correct that an index flow of zero means that that water management area is a catchment of an intermittent stream and therefore is not regulated? No, it, it doesn't mean that. There's some um, uh, rivers in the uh, thumb area that can get down to a zero flow uh, sometimes in the summer, um, but it's flowing, um, most years it's flowing, um, you know, most of the year, and it's only during the, the short summertime. So they are regulated streams, and they're regulated as streams, but they're in kind of a unique situation. Well, I know we're undergoing a study. I don't know if it's underway yet, but but uh, MSU is doing a study for Eagle on, on identifying intermittent streams. But I thought by definition, a river course, uh, a water course rather, with an index flow of zero was by definition an intermittent stream and therefore not uh, regulated under this um, statute. However, if this is backwater, from the Great Lakes high water <clears throat> levels, then it seems to me the issue is one of um, the regulations would apply for a direct withdrawal from the water course, because that by definition would be a direct withdrawal from the Great Lakes. But I still contend that the statute does not provide authority to regulate groundwater withdrawals in the watershed of an intermittent stream. Well, and in this case, Dave, um, we had in Wiscogan drain, we have both direct surface water withdrawals and groundwater withdrawals. And it's pretty complex. Physically, a zero CFS makes no sense. But there is under the mouth of the water management area is under the influence of the high lake levels. So our hydrologists are coming up with a workaround proposal and we're going to take that back to find out which uh, committee in the council is the appropriate one to tackle that and then take it back to the appropriate committee and then it does deserve further discussion about how we should be handling these type of watersheds. And that may be one of the things we talk about is which committee should have that. Uh, let's let's get to the next slide. 
before there's more questions on this, because I think that's going to help um, uh, flesh out this issue or these issues. Okay, this map shows the locations of zone B coal transitional watersheds in yellow and zone C in orange, where Eagle has received eight or more SSRs depleting the watershed. Um, latest count as of beginning of October, we're talking about 20 zone B coal transitional water management areas and 44 zone C water management areas. And as of, Andy can correct this number, but as of the beginning of October, I think statewide there are like 158 zone C water management areas. So way too big enough, the universe was way too big for really zeroing in. So we tried to figure out, okay, how can we filter that out and get to areas that are getting a lot of attention and what we came up with is a proposal is okay how many of these have had at least eight ssrs to date so are you and the next I, go ahead dave yeah go back to the map please um the the, the tables will fill in the details uh but but this map i think is important uh, because it really shows that there's kind of a clustering. Now, we did look at um, watershed management areas that have multiple site-specific reviews have been done. That means this is an area that there's active irrigation or active water uh, withdrawal activity, and it's happening a number of times where the applicant has got to go through the site review process and guarantee that that's going to happen again the next time somebody comes in that wants to. I'm not sure how each of these are being resolved. Maybe that um, you know they're working with other uh, irrigators and reducing irrigation, or they're reducing the request or changing location. But there's only so many times they're going to be able to do that. And um, I think that the long-term solution is that we need to model these areas. And what I wanted to look at in kind of clustering these with. Uh, having a number of site specific reviews is kind of like, are there areas that might be higher priority than others? And I don't want to forget about other zone Cs, but um, if you've got a lot in, in a relatively small area, that should draw our attention to it. So as we look at it, we could say that, you know, our idea of doing some regional models makes sense. And I think this is pointing out areas where we want to do those models. So we've got one that's going now in Cass County already. If we had another one, two, or three in that southwestern um, uh, lower Michigan, that that could cover those areas pretty nicely. And then maybe another one up in Montcalm area, another one in uh, Muskegon, Ottawa County area. Um, so if we got models that would help uh, give us um, a real good definition of what are the water resources here, what's the water balance here, the water budget, and then what's the impact of um, these wells as well as new wells coming in, it's going to give us a much better uh, way to scientifically assess the impacts of the withdrawals and be able to hopefully either resolve these or be able to come to a decision that yes, um, we are at the end of the rope here, or this is what we can still fit in and have a way to do it. So um, I, I think that's the tale that this tells us. And I would like a you know, discussion from the council as to what other thoughts are, but these are areas that we are seeing a lot of site specific review requests come in on a repeated basis, and I think we need to get a better handle on uh, the water budgets in these areas. Okay, this slide and the next slide are tables similar to the Zone D table where you've got the watershed name and number, location, stream type. Here you've got the index flow review index flow value, either the initial estimate or the result of the index flow review after an SSR allowable depletion. So multiply the index flow by the percent allowable depletion in the statute and what the current status is in gallons per minute. Zone B cold transitional water management areas are shown in red. If you see a negative number, that's negative because we're not showing 
depletions from pending SSRs with the exception if we have requests for after the fact authorizations for existing withdrawals that have already been in operation. So those type of withdrawals would kick it into the negative. And I acknowledge that you're not going to be able to read the fine print here on your screen. Um, that's why we'll send out, we have sent out and we will send out a PDF version for you to print off and look at it at your leisure if you want to study this in more detail. And that did go out, so everybody should have that copy. And that pretty much wraps it up. So are there any questions that the council members have at this point? It's giving you a lot of chew on, so study those tables and maps at your leisure. And if you have additional questions, feel free to contact us and we'll uh, be happy to talk with you further. Well, thank you. I think, you know, the evidence here just reinforces the need for further studies down, in particular, the southwest corner. Thank you both. I see Todd's got his hand up. Uh, thanks, everybody. Just wanted to um, make sure we were recalling we do have the, the pilot model in CAS. There's another model that was submitted but not approved but could be potentially with some additional edits in St. Joe County that covers most of St. Joe. And we currently have a proposal in front of Eagle right now up in Calhoun for doing a model as well. So there's three regional size models all in that hotspot area that are already being looked at or studied along with um, quite a number of uh, monitoring wells up in the area with some long term records as well. We're talking about Todd, this is Dave Hamilton. Could you send that uh, St. Joe model to the models committee? I think we'd like to take a look at that. Yeah, I think we can make arrangements for that. And then the Calhoun, that's still a work in progress. Yeah, there's a work plan up for review right now. I haven't received written comments back on that yet, but um, and that would cover essentially the um, maybe the a third of about Calhoun County um, over on into Kalamazoo County. Okay, great. Okay, Andy, it looks like you got your hand up. <clears throat> yep, just uh, real quick, a couple points of clarification, uh, several of the topics that were discussed uh, in the course of, of your presentation here, Jim. So I guess first off, that Wiscoggin drain issue, um, and that zero flow, I know there are several comments and questions about that. That that one is not one of those instances where um, you know that the zero index flow was was due to due, due to uh, no flow in the summer. It wasn't an intermittent stream, as as David mentioned. That that was just the result of the high lake levels, Lake Huron levels that are that are causing a backwater at the the previous mouth of that watershed. So the so the workaround. I think it's important for folks to know the workaround that hydrologic studies will do for that is just to basically shift the mouth of that water management area further upstream to where it's no longer under a backwater influence and therefore there is flow it does not go to zero at that point um, as far as index flow if we just shift it up there so that's 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 a, i think that's important to know how that's being handled um and then also the uh, day i know dave lush had mentioned you know this the 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 statutory like a mandate as far as regulating flows only for these perennial streams that don't have the zero index flow and it's really not stated that way in the statute um, we get to that same point that same actual functional administrative point where we have to regulate streams that that are perennial flow and don't go to zero flow um, as an index flow estimate for them um, just by inference so we have to do that just by reading the you know the, basically the provisions in the law um, and know that that we're protecting decreases to index flow and so if the index flow is zero, obviously we can't decrease it further. Um, so that's kind of how we get to that point. It's not actually uh, explicitly stated in the law that, that we only protect perennial streams, nor does it say that we have to protect intermittent streams or what have you, but it's just kind of, we get there by inference, just kind of in, important, I think, um, for folks to know that. 
and then the last thing um is just on the on all this uh great discussion about the models and improving models and using more regional models instead of the statewide um it, it is you know obviously that's that's where we're going to hang our hat and that's the direction we need to go um but also keep in mind folks that doing so is not necessarily going to only improve the situation um as far as our watershed accounting and, and relation to an ari occurring or not you know for instance in the table that we showed here osborne drain um and dave dave hamilton had mentioned how that that area would be covered by the cass county study which is which is true. However, if we'd use the values that came out of that study, the um, the deplete the situation, how far in the negative we would have been, would have actually been greater. Uh, so by using sort of the the default characteristics in the tool where we sit where we do right now, could because all the Cass County information hasn't been fully um, integrated into the water assessment tool, and all the depletions have not been recalculated based on the information. If we do that, if we do that based on what would ostensibly be you know, obviously more accurate data collected via the Cass County pilot study, this situation would actually be worse for Osborne Drain. And that's just an example. Obviously it could go either way, but just just want folks to keep that in mind. You know, more accurate data does not always mean more water available. Yeah, and that's a good point, Andy. It doesn't mean more water is available. But um, one of the things we would be careful of is that even if you have more accurate data, if you're just using analytical models, you're not answering the water budget question, which is the real question here. So we really need to get the numerical model um, finalized and, and use that with the more accurate information. Andy, thank you for your explanation. Uh, Michael, your hands up. No, I don't think it is. I see it, but yeah, I no, I unless you, there's another mic on here, I wasn't. No, it looked like you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Any, anybody else? Questions or comments for Dave or Jim? Well, thank you uh, both for the more detailed explanation. It gives us all a much greater understanding of the challenges in front of us. Mr. Brian Burroughs is up with the gavel in hand next. All right. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everybody. It's good to uh, be with you, at least electronically this fall. I hope everything's going well. Um, hey, let's keep uh, let's keep rolling. And if Jim Milne, if you are ready to provide us um, your Eagle uh, administrative update, you're, you're queued up. OK, thank you, Brian. Well, good afternoon again. This is a program update for Eagles Water Use Program. I'm going to give you an update on water use assessment unit personnel, and then I'm going to provide updated metrics for program year 12. It's still in progress. Began the program year began on July 9th, so the metrics will be July 9th through the end of October 2020. And I'm also going to provide some updated cumulative metrics for program years 1 through 12, uh, beginning when the tool went live in 2009 through 2020. And as I um, bear in mind that the program year for water use program runs from July 9th to July 8th of the following calendar year. And then finally, I want to share, because of the timeliness issue, I want to share some details with you about a request for proposals that the Joyce Foundation recently issued. OK, so personnel update. Um, unfortunately, Mike Osier and Alex Pink resigned from state service to pursue other career opportunities. So that effectively means that my units back down to two SSR staff, Clay and Nathaniel, since virtually all of Jill's time is being spent on groundwater model reviews peer screening requests for public water supplies and offer dispute resolution complaints. My unit also has a vacancy for another geologist, senior geologist modeler position. All three vacancies are affected by the hiring freeze and WRD must request exemptions from the hiring freeze to fill them. I've updated the vacancy packages so they'll be ready to post once we get the green light to post them. And today I just got news that we're going to, the division will put forward two of the three. 
So looks like uh, we'll try pushing forward the Geologist 12 modeler and one of the two S Geologist 9 through 11 SSR positions request an exemption from the hiring freeze. And once we get the green light, go ahead and post those. Okay, the next slide. Um, as of the end of October 2020, we received a total of 170 large quantity withdrawals have been authorized in the per in program year 12. 143 were authorized through the tool and 27 through site specific reviews. And again, the program year runs from July 9th to July 8th of the following calendar year. So how are we doing in terms of timeliness? Our average number of days to complete a SSR is holding pretty steady right now at 7.9 days. Our percent completed within the 10 business days and as a reminder the statute deadline is 10 business days for completing an SSR. It's gone down somewhat, it's now at 77%. That's affected by the number of SSR received We've gotten a lot busier this fall than we were in the spring. Staffing levels and other factors. Cumulative from 2009 through the present, we're still trending in the right direction in terms of average number of business days to complete an SSR is continuing to decrease. And the percent of SSRs completed with 10 business days continues to increase. Our compliance metrics, these figures are totals for the period between July 9th and the end of October 2020. When we say amended registrations, that's where a large quantity withdrawal was put into operation differently than what was authorized either by the tool or by an SSR, but there was stream flow, enough water available to authorize the as built as operated withdrawal. So we issued an amended registration. So we've done 214 of those. After the fact registrations cover previously unregistered large quantity withdrawals that in fact we discover them, but it turns out that there's enough stream flow to go ahead and authorize them after the fact, so we do so. 58 of those and missing pump information when we come across a well log where the well log doesn't have any pump information. Uh, a common example of that would be a horizontal well where quite often the pump is not installed in the horizontal well at the time it was drilled and somebody else or the property owner will put a well in at a later date. So we have to contact the property owner and the well driller and get the missing pump information. So 69 of those. First violation notices, we sent out eight. If we're not, we haven't followed up with any second violations during this period, we also haven't closed any out during this period and we've received one complaint. Public water supply pre-screening reviews for July 9th through the end of October. Jill authorized nine of those denied one and two of those were retracted by the applicant. So that's essential, pre-screening reviews are essentially the equivalent of an SSR, but done for drinking, Eagle Drinking Water Division under the Safe Drinking Water Act. They have to meet the same standards in terms of avoiding an adverse resource impact that they would, any other withdrawal would have to do under 327 in addition to whatever other criteria drinking water has under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, the Joyce Foundation, um, they provide funds to support policy work to protect the Great Lakes. Some of you who were on the first incarnation of this council might recall that we had a Joyce Foundation grant that paid for Laura Young to provide administrative support for the council. So they've currently got a request for proposals 
to assess state and tribal groundwater policies in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And the reason I wanted to bring this up today, there's an informational webinar that they're having on November 13th, this Friday. And there's the uh, website there. The request for proposal responses are due December 15th, 2020. And when you go to the website, that provides you with additional information about the webinar, the re request for proposals, and how to apply for the grant. So are there any questions? So Jim, I'll start while people are um, deciding to raise their hand or not. And I'll just say that um, given the map about the depleted watershed management areas that we just saw um, in your year 12 so far, um, roughly how many withdrawal or registration requests have you had to decline? Okay, that. Let me, if you bear with me a second, I will have to pull up a different email where we've got those statistics. Um, you know what? Rather than waste everybody's time while I'm fumbling through my emails trying to find the right one, why don't I get back to you? Sure. With that answer, and we can send that out to the entire council if you want. Sure. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. I just, I mean, seeing the pressure going up, um, I was curious. Uh, does anybody else have any questions about the um, program update? I'm not seeing any hands, but I'll give it another minute just in case. And um, and I'll I'll let everybody know that um, the hiring freezes um obviously will will start affecting ssrs and you know and what uh, the existing staff can do and, and how much their bandwidth gets spread around and um so we um we discussed in an executive committee meeting to just kind of keep our eyes on that and to um see how eagle does getting the uh, request for um an ability to, to fill those vacancies and uh, depending on how that goes, we may we may decide to have a conversation and and perhaps write some letters of support if that's needed um, to discuss what that means to to all of us as stakeholders. Oh, okay. So I see Dave Hamilton has his hand raised. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, Jim. Um, that uh, request for proposals. Do you know what is um, mo motivating that? Why they're asking for that assessment? Huh. Not entirely. Um, the website will provide further background. They've, the Joyce Foundation has taken an interest in water policy issues in the Great Lake Basin for a number of years now. And they're, I think this, the thrust of this most recent request for proposals is basically to bring in groundwater policies in alignment with previous analysis of surface water policies to get kind of a more holistic approach, but that's about the extent of my understanding. Um, James Cliff, maybe you know a little bit more. Sorry, I aimed to my mute button there. Um, that sounds right. It's just a general interest in this area. And, you know, I think probably encouraging the states to share best practices in this this arena. OK, um, Frank, looks like you had a question. Uh, yes, I had a, a comment about the Joyce Foundation and uh, we had a presentation at the United Tribes of Michigan from the, the director there who rolled out the some of the thinking behind what they're doing and that this comes from sort of re reevaluating their their uh, their uh, strategic plan and and how they're how they're going to be putting their their funds out and that caused them to uh, uh they came up with this particular uh way of looking at things because they wanted to help 
you know, that they're part of the Fo Joyce Foundation has been to look at things from a regional basis, not just a specific uh, state basis or a, a particular agency basis. And so they, uh, the explanation was that they were looking to this. They've presented this for the tribes as well, uh, for the tribal organizations to be looking at this, uh, at this uh, uh, pro uh, request for proposal. So I'm not sure how this is going to all shake out, but, but I did realize that, you know, that, that this was a much broader that to try to help bring some regionality into, into the way this is looked at. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, mm. Thanks. I see Jim Nick Nicholas also has a comment to make. Oh, I, I think uh, Frank and James covered anything I would have said about the RFP. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would I would just say that um, <clears throat> I, I would suspect that some um, who whoever or whichever entity gets this contract to do this, I thought in my read through it that they were looking for an entity who uh, one entity to do all of the summary analysis for all of the states. And so uh, um, I would say that uh, many of us uh, in this body with the work that we're doing will probably receive some level of uh, reach out from whoever gets selected to pull this off. Um, so that may be something that we uh, you know, navigate uh, next year uh, once it's selected and, and we will figure out how we can help facilitate that entity and um, understanding the mission. Yeah. Hey, hey, Brian, this is Tom. Um, just real quick on that, not to belabor it, but for folks on the phone, it sounds like th that there is the interest is to have probably one entity and, and an impartial kind of third party entity. And so, you know, group that you know, quote unquote, have a stake in it um, as opposed, or are I think probably less favorable than than groups or organizations that take much more of a, like almost like a legal review of, of policies. Um, you know, just a little more background for folks. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jim, you have your hand back up? Yeah, I just can say that I, I my understanding is more than one entity could work on this, but the fund would go to a single entity who then might distribute it to others. And it'd start in February next year and end the following February. So it's a one year project, but they want to keep this emphasis on groundwater for five to 10 years. So it'll be interesting to see what else comes down the road. Yeah. Yeah, let's hope that it sets up the foundation well for um, a period of uh, focus and uh, renewed investment into uh, water policy work again. Okay, uh, Frank, you still have your hand up. Is that uh, lingering or do you have another comment? Frank? All right. Well, uh, thank you, Jim. I don't see any other questions at this point. Um, so the, the next thing that we had on our list, and I'm, I'm guessing maybe we have already covered this earlier on, um, Kelly and Emily, um, is there unique um, items for discussion here, or did we end up um, handling the items contemplated for here earlier on in the edits? Brian, if I could, this the this section of the agenda, um, we had asked Emily and, and Kelly to kind of walk through uh, some of the logistical aspects of developing this new committee. So since last month, uh, the council approved creating the new committee. Now we got to figure out, all right, what do we call it? Uh, who's going to be on it? Who's going to chair it? You know, Perfect. all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, okay. So, so Emily and Kelly, if you're comfortable, um, you can go ahead and take the reins here, and we'll get the uh, we'll help try to help get the conservation committee, water conservation committee, up and running and, and ironed out. All right, thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. We have had some preliminary conversations. Um, Laura had asked us, you know, would you change the name of this committee from Water Conservation and Efficiency Committee to something maybe that's a little more palatable and easier to say, right? Like we've got the Models Committee and the Data Committee, and then this committee has a very, very long name. Uh, maybe Emily and I just aren't creative enough, uh, but. We didn't think of another name that we would call it because really that uh, 
conservation and efficiency uh, really were the things that we focused on uh, in in this committee. So I think that we're open to changing the title of the committee. Uh, Emily and I also were asked if we would uh, continue to kind of um, chair this committee. And I guess this brings up a bigger conversation for the, the full council as neither Emily or nor myself are actually uh, council members. So I, I guess instead of, um, or for fear of stepping on toes, uh, I am curious uh, about how the council members actually feel about non-council members and alternates leading committees uh, before we would actually say whether or not we kind of take that uh, responsibility on again. Okay. Does anybody have thoughts? Um, this is sort of a, a, a little bit of a void in our governance policy. Um, I'm not sure we contemplated it one way or the other. Um, I think historically we have been happy to receive the time and energy and good thoughts um, of anybody who who is willing to take the reins and participate. Um, and, you know, obviously, as a reminder, the council has to pass, um, you know, pretty much consensus recommendations. And so um, I think that also helps to alleviate some, you know, kind of formal governance, but um, interested to hear um, what people's opinion on that. So I see Laura Campbell, then Doug Needham, and then Frank, let's start with Laura. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, and I'll say I agree with you that I, you know, we, we're definitely appreciative of anybody who's willing to put the 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 time and mental energy and uh, all of the all of the work into the into the tasks that this group does. Um, one of the other things that that I, you know, I kind of feel is pertinent to the discussion is that we decided pretty early on when this new council formed that. Uh, if council members identified alternates, that those alternates have the ability to take votes, to do anything that a full council member does, um, because we didn't want to hold up the process or have a council member come in and say, oh, I wasn't here, so I didn't get a chance to, you know, vo voice my concern over something, you know, and, and you know, now I want to do over. Um, and so I think that that's relevant to this discussion that, you know, if there are if there are folks who, you know, who serve as alternates uh, for council members that, you know, that if there's a concern about, well, you know, do we want to make sure that there's somebody who's a council member who's who's running a committee? Uh, I, you know, I would say alternates fill that role just the way that they do for any other purpose for the committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, what are your thoughts? All right. Well, I certainly uh, I, I agree that I appreciate anybody that's willing to step up and, and take a lead or a role on this. I, I have no problem with someone that's not on the full council uh, being the chair or leading uh, a break off committee since it does have to still report through the Water Use Advisory Council. My only recommendation would be that we have someone from the council that participates and is on that committee. They don't need to lead it but it would just be nice to have some connection into that. Absolutely, thank you, Doug. Uh, Frank. Uh, well, as uh, I was gonna endorse what you had said earlier, uh, Brian, and uh, I think that's important. And, and as to the last comment, as a council member, I would be glad to serve on that committee. I'm not in a position to chair it, but I certainly would be willing to serve on it. Excellent. Thank you. Those are the comments that I particularly love to hear are people signing up for things. So thank you, sir. Um, OK, anybody else have any? It sounds as though there's um, a, a general willingness and um, support for proceeding uh, forward uh, without necessarily having uh, designated council members at the helm. Um, are there any objections to that? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Raise your hands quickly if you do. Um, okay, so then I will turn and I will um, I will ask the pointed question for documentation. Uh, Kelly and Emily, are you both willing to serve as co-chairs for the Water Conservation Committee? 
so at the risk of stepping over Emily on this, uh, we have had that conversation and, and neither one of us really have the time to chair it, but we're both willing to co-chair it. Um, I have organizational skill sets where Emily uh, has the technical knowledge. So uh, I felt like we uh, had a pretty good team, especially with the group of people that were um, on this work group. And so I guess if it's all right, Brian, I'd like to um, see who would like to continue serving on this committee and then find out if anyone really has a burning desire to take over as the chair, because I think both Emily and I would be OK with that, too. Okay. Well said, Kelly. <laughs> OK, um, all right. So I'll just list off the people who uh, I have as uh, the folks who served this last go around. And so uh, if that way they can say if they would prefer not to be on this committee, um, we could add people then if they would like to be added to this committee and we can kind of keep that updated and then and then decide uh, on the chair if you're OK with that. Um, Jason Walther. Um, Emily Finnell, Jeremiah Asher, Frank Edowagishik, I get happy every time I say it right, uh, Abby Eaton, Tom Frazier, Andy LeBaron, and Hannah Arnett. So does anyone want to be removed, I guess is my first question. Quickly move on. <laughs> OK, good. Yes, we don't want to leave much time for that. Um, does anyone want to be added to this list? Kelly, you can add me to the list. This is Pat Stasco. Pat? Okay. Thanks, Pat. Anybody else at this time? OK, so what I would say is you, you have you have a good list for now. And and as always, um, all council members, alternatives, uh, alternates, I'm sorry, um, should all feel invited and welcome to participate. And um, and, and in fact, I, this kind of goes across the board. Everybody should be monitoring the work that the committees do. And if if you are not a regular participant, but some item, particular item pops up in a committee, it is really best for you to jump in, even if it's just for that specific issue, and to participate in the committee so that, um, you know, you can spend the time there to make sure that your perspective is heard and addressed rather than kind of waiting um, for it to come to the full council. So please, you know, know that everybody should jump in either, you know, regular or just one off here and there and, and get the work done in the committees. Um, so uh, given that, um, are there any of those participants that that feel a desire and willingness to help co-chair this committee? Hearing none, I'm going to quickly move on and say that um, Emily and Kelly, uh, I believe I will. I will also say I'm. I am nominating them as co-chairs for this committee. If there are any objections, uh, speak up or raise your hand, Council. And not hearing any, congratulations. It's official, and uh, we appreciate your help and involvement. Um, what else? can we do for you before we move off of this topic to uh, make sure that you have what you need to keep moving? Uh, I think that that basically does it. We have a contact information for everyone uh, that's on the committee and even the new folk, new person, sorry, new person. Um, if anyone has, uh, you know, a strong feeling about what they would like the name of this committee to be, uh, other than water conservation and efficiency, uh, I'd be happy to entertain those thoughts. Good, 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 good. OK, all right. Well, thank you very, very much. Both of you, thank you. OK, so the next agenda item is just a brief discussion uh, about meetings. Uh, the next one and then the future for 2021. Uh, You'll, you'll note that our next meeting is scheduled for December 15th. Um, that, that's on the calendars already. But um, more importantly, we wanted to just have a brief discussion and, and to hear from anybody who has some thoughts right now about um, 
the nature of our meetings for next year. So um, obviously we we have to identify some times. Um, we we kept notes about general times that can be good for people and are a little bit worse for people. Um, but we'd like a little feedback on um, are we good? Do we feel good setting off in 2021 with bi-monthly um, or every other month meetings of the full council and then allowing the committees to kind of set their own pace in their own meetings? And um, for our full council meetings, um, how does the two to three hour time frame seem to be working for folks? So if, if anybody is willing to or has, a, you know, some opinions for us right now, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. We have a couple more minutes. Um, we'd love to hear from anybody. Frank, go ahead. Uh, I, I certainly, uh, well, we've had an accelerated meeting schedule as we closed in on this report. I think the bi-monthly meetings worked and I, I, I really, uh, um, I prefer to try to set our schedule up for the two hour meetings, but but always leave, have things set up so that we can go over if we need to, because I hate to hit at the end of it without it being able to truly address everything on the agenda. So that uh, as long as we're putting it on the calendar, we should probably reserve three hours. But if we have efficient leadership that gets us through quicker, I am perfectly happy with that. Thank you. Thank you, that, that sounds wise. Thank you. Anybody else? Jim? I'm with Frank. Okay, perfect. Dave Lush? Um, since we're gonna be contacting the legislature, I guess now it'll be February after the committee assignments uh, have been made. Should we start our bi-monthly schedule with January just so we can prep for that or do it in February when it's actually occurring? That That is the dialogue hopefully with the legislature. Um, good question, thank you. We will, um, I'll, I'll punt that for now for time's sake and say we'll have a good dis robust discussion about that. Um, at our next executive committee uh, meeting. I, I, you know, we will be getting the report out as was mentioned um, in December um, and we won't, it may be a while before we know committees and it will certainly be a little while before we get scheduled into the committees, but we'll start trying um, behind the scenes to have some discussion with legislative leadership um, about the time frames to get to um, presentations and so once we get a little bit better read on that, that's a great um, question of whether we would want to skip the January and start with February or whether we need the January. So I don't know the answer to that, but uh, thank you for raising it. We'll get that figured out pretty quick. Um, I see Frank and, and Dave Lush, you still have your both still have your hands up. Frank, do you have a, another an additional question or a comment? That's that's a lingering hand. Sorry. OK, OK. All right, Dave. Um, I don't know if the agenda, if the executive committee has already set the agenda for the December 15th council meeting, but I would like um, the issue that Jim Mill reported on uh, to be on that agenda if possible, because it does involve potentially uh, policy development. And I think the council needs to wade in on that. It's kind of a um, technical issue, so it may, it may take us a little bit of discussing to get it down pat. And it sounds like um, the program staff have already gotten, uh, have already thought about this and have, um, I'll say workarounds, but proposals to move forward. And I, I think we, we need to think about that in a broader council uh, context. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Jim Milne? Just point of clarification about which issue I raised. So you're talking, Dave, you're talking about the Wiscoggin drain, the zero CFS water management areas under the influence of high lake levels, that issue? 
Yes, uh, okay. in particular that issue, because I'm sure with high lake levels, that's not the only one that is affected that way. Um, and it may be hydrologic splitting of hairs, but in interior watersheds, we normally think of the index flow as base flow, that is groundwater is discharging to that channel way, and therefore groundwater withdrawals of a high capacity nature have the potential to adversely impact that water course. Fact, the index flow is zero, then technically that means there is no groundwater flowing to that channel at that time of year. Uh, and I realize that there are other times of the year when there might be flow, but the policy and the law, the statute rather, fixated on index flow, which was the 50% exceedance flow with the low flow period. So it, it just still seems to me that there's quite a few issues to talk about and Wiscoggin drain is sort of the poster child for a more general uh, issue like that. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, we will. And just as a reminder for, for any members, if you are seeing items that you wish to be on agendas for the full council meetings, please send any of us an email. You can send it to Christine Spitzley, you can send it to Laura, Brian, myself, whoever, whoever is easiest up in your email system. And uh, we would glad gladly take those in uh, when we make the agenda. So, so that's an open invite to any of you to make sure that uh, you get those suggestions our way. All right. Um, Ryan? So, Ryan. Oh, Hamilton, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. On that last note, I think we should put it through a committee before we bring it back to the council. Um, that drain and those issues. Um, I don't know which committee it best fits in. I will volunteer the models committee to uh, to handle it, but if someone else wants, I would be glad to defer. Okay, we'll we'll discuss that at the next XCOM. We'll come up with a plan for that. Absolutely, perfect. Um, okay, so if any of you also have any thoughts about next year's worth of meetings, uh, please feel free again to send us an email on those as well. It sounds like there's generally um, uh, good support for uh, every other month and um, schedule three hours, but try as a target to hit two. So um, look for, for more from us on that uh, by the next meeting. So thank you on that. Um, we have, you know, staying on good schedule. Uh, we have only a minute or two left, um, but does anybody on the call today have any uh, comments that they would like to make about agenda or non-agenda items at this time? <clears throat> okay. I'm not seeing anybody. Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, with that, I would accept a motion to adjourn the meeting. So move. So move. All right, I'll second. second. <laughs> uh, okay, I got a second from Dave. We'll call that good. Um, unless anybody is opposed, we are adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, Frank, I was I got nervous there when you mentioned good leadership getting us out on time, but um, thanks for everybody holding their final comments. Uh, we managed to do that. So thank you all. I hope um, hope you all have a, a nice rest of your fall and a good uh, Thanksgiving, and we will see you very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Happy Beckinsville.